Welcome. I'm Margaret Klein Solomon, the founder and director of the Climate Mobilization. We're an organization working to protect humanity in the living world through initiating a whole society emergency speed race to zero emissions. Our climate emergency campaign has led more than 1400 governments around the world to declare a climate emergency. And we did that working with organizing partners, including youth climate strikers who are watching this today. So thank you. And thanks to everyone for joining. Of course, we wish that we were together in the streets, striking and having perhaps the largest demonstration for climate in world history. But I want us to take a moment to remember all of the ways that we are still together, though physically separate. We are all living in the same atmosphere, on the same planet. We all have the same basic human emotions. And we're all here for the same reason, which is our desire, our need to protect humanity and the living world. I'm proud to be joined by my friends and colleagues, fellow climate warriors, David Wallace Wells and Mary Anais Heglar today. David is the author of The Uninhabitable Earth and the deputy editor of New York Magazine. Mary is a climate justice, es climate justice essayist and writer in residence at Columbia University's Earth Institute. So thanks to them both very much. We're also here to celebrate the release of my book, Facing the Climate Emergency, How to Transform Yourself with Climate Truth. It's a self-help guide to facing the reality of the climate emergency and processing the emotions that come with that. The fear, grief, anger, and everything else. And turning that pain into effective action. All proceeds go to Climate Mobilization Project. You can get a free chapter and a chance to win a whole free book at facingtheclimateemergency.com. We're also going to be hosting a follow-up call on Sunday where you can share your feelings with me. So again, that's at facingtheclimateemergency.com. So since it's a self-help book that helps us to take this journey from facing the truth into through, through grief and all these feelings and to action, I thought it would be fitting to talk to two leading climate warriors about their journeys and what their experience has been like. So, David and Mary, no one goes from being aware of the climate emergency intellectually to immediately accepting the fullest implications of the danger we're in. So tell us about your own personal and emotional climate journey. Were there periods of denial, disbelief, fear, optimism? How has it been? Um, yeah, I think I, I came to climate in earnest in 2014. And I would say that was probably, it was a very conscious decision. I decided that um, I wanted to be part of telling the most important story. And I decided that was either public health or climate. And I now know that those are not different things. Um, and so I, I very deliberately went toward um, climate-based nonprofits. And I would say that that's pretty much when I, um, when I broke out of denial. Um, I spent probably about two years in shock of like my, my job at this uh, climate organization, the Natural Resources Defense Council was to uh, edit policy reports. And if you edit things, that means that you interrogate them. That means you ask uh, what this percentage means and what this other figure means. And you start to see how many lives and bodies are buried in between the lines of all of those things. Um, and it freaked me out. 
<laughs> bring me out pretty bad. Um, and it took a while for me to kind of come out of shock and into uh, even sadness. Um, How and, old were you? Um, this was not long ago. So I was 30, 31. Um, so um, you could probably say that the whole time from 18 to 30 was in denial, kind of. I mean, I knew, I knew climate change was real. I didn't deny the science, but I kind of just didn't want to deal with it um, and kind of felt like, can somebody else do it? Um, and so, yeah, I, I came around to, um, yeah, sadness from there, then into fear. Fear and sadness were probably at the same time. Um, and then into anger, which is <laughs> probably the happiest place that you can get with this. Um, and what I think is, is interesting about climate grief as a cycle is that it's a cycle that can't end because you can't get to acceptance. Um, or at least I can't bring myself to get to acceptance because that means that you're like, you're resigned and I can't resign myself. And so I tend to cycle back through sadness and fear and anger and all of these other emotions over and over again, because you can't close the loop. Mm, thank you so much. I, I want to I want to come back to those cycles of emotions and hear hear more about that. But let's hear David's broad journey. You know, I still feel like I'm very much on it, and it's still moving forward. I still feel myself a few years deep into really thinking um, pretty seriously about this stuff. That I'm still living somewhat in denial. I think um, there are actually very few people on the planet who are not. I mean you know, two of them may be in this conversation, but um, in general, I think most people, even those who acknowledge an urgent crisis, um, don't really appreciate just how dramatic the changes that are likely to be will be and how fundamentally that promises or threatens or however you want to put it to change um, really the, the basic building blocks of our societies. Um, and I think there are very few of us who are responding to those facts, the facts from the science with the sense of um, urgency and immediacy that, that the science really demands. So I certainly think of myself as living still somewhat in denial, but considerably more awakened um, than I was a few years ago. And that awakening was really about fear um, almost exclusively, you know, fear mixed with some professional opportunism maybe. Um, but I had, you know, been sort of following the news from climate science for a while, somewhat casually, it was something I was interested in in some theoretical way, but wasn't overly concerned about. And just started to see a lot more alarming news, um, especially through the summer of 2016 and into the fall of 2016. And then I had a sort of um, a bit of a panic attack reading about a particular week in the Arctic um, in early December. So also about a month after Trump was elected mm -hmm. when temperatures were about 40 degrees warmer than they had been or what, than they were supposed to be. And I knew enough at that point about um, runaway climate change, um, which is what we think happened in Venus, taking it from a planet that was roughly Earth-like to very much not Earth-like very quickly, to worry that we were seeing something similar happening here. And pretty quickly, I realized that that was not the case. No scientists were worrying about that. That was sort of a, um, I could like put that fear in the, in the category of paranoia. But in almost every other way, the things that I had started to worry about over that summer and fall, um, didn't just seem to be legitimate to worry about. They seemed to be sort of getting worse by the day and with every week having some new papers that were really quite scary. And the fear, um, it wasn't just that I was personally scared. It was that I had a sort of a vertigo experience where it just felt quite immediately to me that if we took seriously just how transformative these forces would be, that almost nothing that we assumed was permanent in the world um, today would continue to be permanent going forward. And I didn't feel myself um, that there were all that many people talking about climate change in those terms. There was so much more about, you know, what we could do to avoid it and all the business opportunities that were available if we decided to go green and um, how you can change your individual carbon footprint. And it didn't seem to me like we were telling this epic story much bigger than all of us that was unfolding in our lifetimes um, quite improbably. I mean, it's, you know, it's a horrible tragedy, but also an incredible stroke of luck that we're all alive at this incredibly consequential um, period in human history. And just as a storyteller, as a journalist who is interested in, in telling big stories, 
I felt, I guess, sort of like Mary did, that this was like the biggest story of our time, maybe of all time. And it would be um, irresponsible to not try to think and write about it um, as best as I could. Thank you. So one theme that I hear you both talking about is um, something I talk about in the book, which is grieving the future that you thought you had. Um, because to me, Mary, this is the one part of grief that actually can be grieved and then moved through. And you, there is like another side of it the, mm -hmm. for like grieving the people and species that are, are dying. I absolutely agree. It just keeps coming and just keeps like devastating. But I think that like to, to David's point about these like just the fact that the, the future is, will not be like the recent past, just period, not an option. That, that really integrating that, it like, and I, I mean, I, growing up, you know, I was told that the future was bright and, you know, progress, technological progress, social progress, you know, democracy progress, everything, everything's going great. And like, and that I can, you know, be whatever I want to be. And that, yeah, so just realizing that that is, was false um, has mm -hmm. been a, has been a big part of my process. I wonder, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I wonder, does that, does that resonate? And how do, how do you, how do you guys think about that? And also, David, in what ways are you still in denial? Uh, other question. Well, I, um, I feel that very strongly. I also feel like it's in some way a reflection of, um, you know, my sort of demographic status and relative privilege in the sense that, um, you know, I mean, I think we're all children of the 90s and there was a kind of strong um, cultural meta narrative about um, progress. Um, but some of us felt, you know, more confident and more sure of that future than others. And a lot of that had to do with where we were coming from and, and what our families and, um, and the people who we, who we were living among um, had been through in the past. Um, but absolutely, I mean, I, um, I think for me, that's a reason that the story is a bit deeper and longer than just the last few years. It goes back to at least through um, the Great Recession and, and the sort of um, fundamental disarray that that um, unleashed. And, you know, personally, I haven't really come to terms with um, what it means going forward. I think um, I've thought a lot about what different kinds of um, social structures might emerge in, um, in a time of real climate crisis. Um, and it's interesting to me and scary to me, and there are some versions that are quite hopeful, but um, I still, I think at an emotional level, do orient myself towards the world. Um, as it is. Not just as it is, but with some kind of quasi technocratic, even neoliberal expectation that over time progress will unfurl. And I think that's maybe the, the most basic way that I'm still living in denial is um, I have to teach myself and coach myself, um, try to remind myself that um, those were, those promises were probably never really valid, but to the extent that they were even partially valid, um, climate change undermines them quite dramatically. And to the extent that I, you know, want the world to reflect um, some of those values, you know, um, prosperity, justice, equity, et cetera, going forward, um, it won't be, you know, they, they, those values won't be fulfilled just by the, um, the progress of time that we have to fight for them and make them happen ourselves. Um, and for all of those reasons, um, this story has also been for me a story of um, more and more political engagement. You know, I, I, when I started really thinking about climate change, I still I thought about politics a lot, I followed the news, but I didn't think of myself as anything like, or anything approaching um, a, a political actor in the world. And it started to seem to me over the last couple of years um, in particular, that that's, you know, that's a really irresponsible re um, relationship to have to politics when so much is at stake. Have you cried about the climate emergency? I mean, I think the honest answer is no, but I've certainly been like in really dark places about it. Um, and I wouldn't take my own like 
I mean, I cry at some weird things, you know, basically any, any movie on any airplane um, will make me cry. I think there's some science about how like you would get more emotional in the altitude or whatever. <laughs> um, uh, I cry all the time, um, but about climate and other things. Um, I feel like a cry a day is probably my average. Um, but to go back to your earlier question about like grieving the future, um, this is something I haven't quite figured out how to talk about it. Maybe at some point I'll write about it, but um, this notion that um, for my generation of Black people, especially Black Southerners, um, my mother was a baby boomer. And so that means I'm raised by people who either, you know, survived certain levels of Jim Crow and lynching and World War II for my grandfather. Um, and so there, there was this sort of thing of we've cleared the obstacles for you. Yeah. Um, and now you get to live this life with this bright future that we could never have dreamed of um and then as soon as we get there boom climate change um like so i was supposed to have like lived the life that <laughs> you know i didn't have to march in the streets i didn't have to um risk my life i didn't have to do all of these things that they had to do and make all of these same sacrifices um, and so there's a certain amount of grieving that and also a certain um, fear of like bringing it up to them um, yeah. because you kind of feel like you've been through enough. How does that, how does that play out in your family? Like do you, when, when, you, when you talk about climate change, if you talk about climate change with your family, do they talk about it in the same historical perspective that you have or is it different? Um, it depends on the family member. Um, so I, I struggle to share a lot of the stuff with like, in particular, like that generation, my mother's generation, or even my mother herself. Um, if they ask about it, I'll definitely talk to them about it. Um, but I know a lot of people have this kind of struggle where they're trying to force their parents to be more environmentally conscious. Um, and I don't put that sort of burden on my family because I already know that I mean, black people have some of the smallest carbon footprints out there, number one. And number two, it's really not about um, individual actions. I mean, they're nice, um, but that's really not the point. So I think there's a big difference between getting my, you know, blue no matter who voting family to reduce their recycling versus like getting your Trump <laughs> supporting families to, to reduce their carbon footprint and become more conscious about climate change. Um, so yeah, sometimes it can be awkward, but like with a lot of my cousins and people of my own generation, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to them about it. Margaret, how would you answer this question? How has it changed your relationship with your extended family? I have some Trump supporters in my extended family and, uh, yeah, I have some frackers in my extended family and there are some, uh, there are some splits that may be permanent, um, mm. which is sad in a way, but I just, I, some, some things are more important than family ties to, yeah. Mm. And, and I feel, I mean, the act of supporting Trump per, particularly, but I is just kind of, for me, like beyond the pale. How, how about you, David? Well, I don't, you know, I, I don't have those kinds of people in my family, but I think in general, my instinct is kind of to play nice and also to compartmentalize um, so that I find, I think maybe more like what Mary is talking about that um, I, I, you know, there are a lot of people with whom I talk about climate a lot, but they're not necessarily the people who I'm closest to in my family. Um, that, you know, my, those relationships go back a lot deeper than my awakening here. And while I think everybody knows where my mind is at and we talk about it occasionally, um, it doesn't dominate those relationships like I think it does for other people. And, and you know, that's, again, another sign that I'm, um, you know, less less far along on my journey of awakening than, than you are maybe. Um, There's no one way. No, 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 of course, of right. course, um, of course. I just, you know, um, you know, when to hear you say there are things that are, you know, more important than family, um, there's part of me that sort of um, recoils a little bit because I feel 
on the one hand, obviously that's undeniably true. Like there, the things that we're trying to fight for are much bigger than we are at all. And um, more important to get right than anything we could get right in our own lives. And yet I still feel in my own life, you know, the pull of other priorities too. Sure. Yeah. Part of it for me is I'm just um, constitutionally very, very honest to the point of uncomfortable, socially awkward, what, what, you know, and so I just can't, I like never could not on any issue be like, whatever, phony, cheerful kind of thing. If I'm in a bad mood, you're going to know about it and you're going to know why. That's just, yeah. But I think it's one of the great things about your book is that, you know, a lot of people having some version of this awakening, one of their first impulses is like, what can I do? Or how can I fit this into my life? Or how do I build out? If I want to take action, what does taking action look like? It may feel so distant and an abstract, a, an idea. And, um, you know, one of the great virtues and values of this work is that it does provide a kind of a roadmap, especially for someone who, like you, immediately is like, well, I do need to follow all of these um, revelations to their logical conclusions and do everything I can to avoid the future I fear happening. But even for people who are um, less immediately um, revolutionized, um, what you're saying is here, you know, here, here is, here is a path towards um, responding to this news as a responsible person. Um, here are the things you can do and the steps you can take, not just you know, um, at a political level, but even as, at a personal level that will allow you to live up to your own, um, your own awakening here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. One thing, one thing that I just wanna bring up because it, um, people talk all, obviously in climate all the time about science and we should follow the science, but really this is about morality and and our our values uh, all that science can do is describe what's happening but mm -hmm. there's no law that says that we need to care or or take human life or other life seriously i frankly have been shocked to see how much people care about human life in response to covid because i was like whoa like you guys like actually really don't want to die and don't want other people to die. Whereas with climate, that is, we're not acting like that. We're, we're acting like it's, you know, that life is so cheap and that only the economy in the short term matters. How do you account for that? Let me, let me uh, flip that. To I think you spelled the question. <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of people who are staying home right now are staying home out of fear, out of personal fear, in addition yeah. to like yeah. social concern. Even so, when I look out at the world, I think, my God, we've, we've, we've developed, it's like a, a, across the Northern hemisphere, we are um, taking measure, protective measures, but also enduring an enormous amount of suffering at the psychological level, at the financial level, like in order to protect one another. And even if that was, even if that has been enacted through a lot of self-interest, it's still like, to me, a kind of breathtaking um, performance of solidarity and and um, and I see the same contrast with climate action that you do, which is that um, at best you see that with climate at a pretty small scale, not yet inter you know internetworked like this is, but this is um, I don't know it seems like an incredibly um, it's just an amazing um, series of events. I, yeah, I think there's so many parallels that can be drawn and, and are being drawn, uh, including uh, by Mary um, in, her, in her work. Um, and I, I think that to me, the core of it, the core of our different differential response is the fact that socially uh, we've re all recognized, and that's obviously very media driven and also government driven and institutionally driven, but we've all recognized that this is an emergency and we're showing it through wearing masks and gloves and not going out and posting on social media about our quarantine, whatever situations and clapping at seven, all, all these social rituals and every headline. And that those are all of the things that we're not doing for climate. It's not every headline. 
institutions aren't taking it seriously, people aren't talking about it all the time, we're not signaling to each other that we're in danger. But it does, it really does give me hope in the sense that I think when you do climate work for, you know, I've been in this for six years, that it, it there is a sense of, is it, do people care about life? Is that, is that what's at the bottom of this? Just a total lack of empathy and humanity and a kind of like rotted out soul in the middle of the American experience. And I am very pleased to think, okay, all right, people want to live. Yes. Yeah. Um, I love your optimism. I want some. I don't want to take it away from you. But at the same time, I don't think that people would be staying home and wearing masks and doing all of these things if there weren't so many mandates around it. And I think there's a lot of evidence in the early days of this of people just like, I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to go to spring break. I'm going to go to St. Patrick's Day Parade. Um, and I don't care because I'm not immunocompromised as far as I know. I'm not older and this isn't my problem. Um, so there's that. And like, I would just never, ever underestimate people's ability to be ridiculous. <laughs> um, so <laughs> we've done it over Probably and over. Wise. Right. Um, so what this really illustrates to me is that individual action is not going to be enough because we've socially distanced. We've done it. We're doing the thing. We're wearing the mask. We're washing our hands. We still got a pandemic on our hands and we're going to have that until there's structural systemic change. Um, and so, yeah, I, and also back to David's point, I don't think that people are staying home and doing these protective measures because they care about other people. I think they're doing it because they're more motivated about not getting sick themselves and they see the immediate threat to themselves. Whereas with climate, one, a lot of people still think it's far away, they're wrong. Um, but it also doesn't happen in one fell swoop. Whereas Corona feels like, especially if you're in New York right now, it feels like one fell swoop, um, as opposed to like a hurricane here or a wildfire there. Back to climate, though we can bring in Corona as needed, but how has reckoning with the climate emergency changed you as a person? Your personality, priorities, identity, how you think about yourself? Yeah, I mean, for me, I, um, it gave me a, a real purpose. I, I think in a lot of ways I had been um, somewhat directionless and even to a degree kind of selfish in my directionlessness. And as I mentioned earlier, I think it's also made me a much more committed um, person politically than I had been before. Um, and, you know, one maybe trivial, I've had a kind of similar experience with Mary where it's it's been... Um, somewhat gratifying, but mostly uncomfortable um, becoming, you know, someone who is asked to weigh in on this kind of thing. But um, the part of that that's most strange is when people who I'm quite, quite close with um, want to come to me for like climate therapy. And Margaret, I'm sure that you get this actually a lot. I'm in this especially weird place because it's like my I'm like an alarmist, like uh, people, like if, if, you know, if you want to come to, if you want to ask someone how, like that, say like, it's not going to be that bad, right? Can you tell me it's not going to be that bad? Probably I'm not the person you want to be doing that to. Um, and yet I think it's a sign of how little climate anxiety has sort of pervaded our social culture generally, that these people have no one else to turn to. Like, it's not like they know someone else who really can comfort them about climate. I'm the only person who knows anything about climate that they know. Um, or so they think. Um, and it's a really strange situation to be in, in which I actually do, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier about how I, um, I do sort of play nice. I do find myself like sort of being like, okay, it's not gonna be that bad. Um, you know, I, I like give them some top line numbers, but I'm also like, but you know, you have to think about it and these blah, 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 just because I feel like the, the emotional need that they're expressing is so acute. And even in just that um, immediate encounter, so much of me wants, just to help them feel a little better. Um, and I f try to find some amount of um, comfort, you know, some, something comforting to tell them um, when put in that position, mm -hmm. even if that's, you know, not in the big picture, the most intellectually or even politically responsible thing to do. I do you ever, go ahead. I'm sorry. Do you ever tell them like things to do? Like do people come to you and say, what should I do? I'm I mean, sure I mean, 
My main, my main answer to that, I, I'd be curious to know what you guys say when you're asked that is, um, is engage politically on this, prioritize climate in your political choices and try to um, make, you know, make noise um, beyond just voting so that we can have a politics that reflects um, these priorities a little more clearly and directly. But most people, that's not the kind of like advice that most people want. Most people want is like, um, I mean, some people want that, I guess, but most people want like, um, if you do X, you can then feel less guilty about the, the contribution that you're making to the problem. Um, and I, yeah. I personally tend to think that that what kind of thinking is just not, um, uh, you know, not productive. Yeah, um, I so I find this like question of what can I do to be really kind of bedeviling, and so I try writing about it recently. Um, and what it, what it kind of comes down to is like people want a simple answer. They want sort of like I'm gonna all right go recycle or go vote. Like if they want it to be like a one time thing, sort of like going to confessional in church and then like you go out and you do it again and then you come back and come back again right so but it's not it's not quite that simple and like if you're ready to go beyond um just you know doing those sort of like i would call them unfulfilling climate actions where like all right now you did it now what there's nothing left um you have to start to get creative and that the complexity of the problem sort of in, invite creativity and the solutions and to kind of like find your way into that space because if you think about how the three of us got involved or other people who are involved in climate nobody gave them a road map um, and sometimes like that kind of like what should I do starts to feel to me like you know when obnoxious guys will be like well how do I be a better feminist and they put the work on women to teach them how to do it and it's kind of like they're playing like you know, playing limbo with it. Like they absolutely, like it's rubber and your glue or whatever. Like they just will not take the advice and take on the responsibility for it. And I think people do that with climate action a lot where they're like, they go up to climate people and like, you tell me what to do. And it's your responsibility to decide how I'm going to operate in saving my own life. <laughs> it's absurd. Right. Yeah. So, so what I, what I, what I say in the book and what I tell people what, who ask me, and they sure do, is number one, talk about it. Talk mm -hmm. about the climate emergency with everyone you know, all your friends, all your family, your colleagues, your neighbors, everybody, and talk about it emotionally and personally. Don't give a PowerPoint. Don't like unload all the stats on them. Just talk about it as like how you feel, what you see when you look at the future, what, I mean, and so that's that's one and then i i totally agree mary that finding your place in the climate emergency movement is as complicated and personal as finding a career path right mm -hmm. you have to look at this whole matrix of what am i good at what do i like doing what am i good at that other people aren't good at you know what does the movement right. need and I, I can't do that for you. You can't do that for them. Like it's so, so it's like, what do I do about It's very climate? personal. Yeah. Is like, start to take that journey. I mean, start to answer yeah. your question because it is a critically important question, but only you can ultimately find the answer. Right. So, they ask, the better question would be, how did you find your niche? Right. Cause like if, if I never asked somebody, what can I do about climate? And they were like, write essays. You know, quite the opposite. People were like, don't do that. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's. But I think the whole conversation is a reflection of how, you know, how in, insufficient to this point our political response has been that um, so many people want um, something to do at the individual level. And I think that's in part a sign that they've given up on the capacity of our politics to really engineer change. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, on some level, that's the, that's the basic, that's the first basic job of responding to the climate crisis is engineering a politics that is capable of, of responding to it. Um, you know, I just, I, the, like, the, I keep thinking back to the fact that the phrase carbon footprint comes from BP. Um, mm -hmm. And like, that has shaped so much thinking about this issue. Um, 
and not just like at the level of media and at the level of, you know, advertising and, and lobbying and all that, but like literally at the way that like people think about this issue as they're like having nightmares and waking mm -hmm. up at night, they, they think about their, their, what they're contributing to the problem yeah. and how they can minimize that contribution. And, um, you know, I understand that on the, on an emotional level, why you want to feel like you're, um, not contributing to the problem and in fact, contributing to the solution, but ultimately, um, the changes that are necessary are not taking place at that level. Um, and we mm -hmm. need to find a way towards making much bigger changes. It's amazing to me how little understanding there is throughout our society. Really, I mean, really on almost every level, but of how change happens and, and like what a social movement is and what it needs. Mm -hmm. You know, people think it's like this kind of spontaneous thing where like suddenly everyone's in the streets and that's, you know, that's the movement and they don't see the planning and the strategy and all these different contributions and unnamed people, you know, that not famous uh, movement celebrities or whatever, but people who are holding meetings every week and making follow-up calls and all of this stuff. And people just don't know. Um, so I think that's, I think that's a major part of both the problem and the solution is to help people see that like we have so much more power than we think or then mm -hmm. i mean then then we're we then when we've been told and that there's really a responsibility to harness that and to maximize it i actually think a lot of people don't see it as a social movement at all i think a lot of people see it as just like this this is the scientist um problem yeah. or this is like some sort of scientific experiment um, so many times when I speak to uh, students in particular who are not super, um, like they're not studying this as their major, so to speak, um, they're just like casually interested, they'll ask me, all right, you do climate communications, who do the scientists need to convince? Um, and what do the scientists need to do? And they don't quite see it as something that we all need to be involved in. Um, and there's also this problem in climate discourse where People are afraid to connect it to other issues, um, even though it is an everything issue. So like there's, um, right now, I'm still hearing a lot of people saying that now is not the time to talk about climate in the, under the auspices of Corona, uh, which couldn't be further than anything. Could you imagine, you know, people are advocating now for people to be let out of prison. Could you imagine people saying now's not the time to talk about prison? No, you wouldn't do that. Um, because it's obviously <laughs> the time and also that the prison reform movement would push back on that. Um, but with climate, for some reason, we're always just, not always, but um, for a very long time, we've been willing to like take a back seat and not rock the boat and all of these other like sort of overly nice things um, and not treating our own issue with the urgency that it demands. Yeah, the what? idea that it's not, that it's not time to talk about climate it's like you must not know what is happening right now so this you know this event today this this live stream is for uh the youth climate strikers you know this is in in place of the amazing strikes that they were planning so what advice do you have for those young people in the in the time of coronavirus and just generally you know i mean we were we were all adults when we came to Climate Truth, and they are not. You know, they are so. So, yeah. What can we What can we offer them? I mean, mostly, I feel like I can offer admiration. Um, the truth is, I, I think um, it's it's engaging in hyperbole and and like generalization, but. Um, I think it's really incredible the degree, the clarity with which um, strikers in particular, but really um, the whole like people younger than me, like see this issue so much clearer and with so much more intensity than people my age and older do. And um, I think the, the biggest message is just like, don't wait until um, your generation's time and power has come. You need. You, we need to we need to help you seize that power, but um, 
you know, you need to seize it. Yeah. Um, I would say um, my heart just breaks for them because, you know, like you said, they, they don't have the luxury of waiting till adulthood before they stare existential dread in the face. And that really sucks. Um, and I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm really sorry that they're in that position. Um, I would say that um, focus less on where the world is going and more on who you want to be in it. Um, Cause I think we often get into like, well, what's going to happen and where are we going to be in 20 years? And um, you'll control as much of that as you can. Um, I'm really proud of this generation. I'm in awe of them, um, but um, I, I believe that they will change the world. I believe that they will change the world for the better, um, but they won't do it alone um, because I refuse to abandon them. And I know that y'all won't either. And so will so many others and understand that we belong to them, not the other way around. You said you, you, said you cry about climate. Does mm -hmm. it make you feel better? It makes me feel human. Um, because I don't want to be the person who can look at this sort of suffering and dying and feel fine. Um, I, um, you know, I've been through periods of my life where I couldn't cry because I was that like emotionally repressed. Um, and I didn't enjoy them. They weren't great. Um, so when I do cry, it's sort of like this reminder that, yeah, I'm feeling what I need to feel. Yes. And then, and of your connection to all all life, humanity, and and life that you you yeah. care. Yeah, and also like you're not a bad person if you don't cry. Don't worry about that, <laughs> David. <laughs> I'm sure you have other ways. Didn't of I, did, I didn't say I never cried. Just that I don't think I cried about climate in particular. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's 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 very true. I everyone everyone has their way. Though I do think I I really do think if you can cry about climate. I think it will help your process. You know, it's right. not it's not like a penance to the gods or something. It's for your own good that I think, you know, I mean, personally speaking, when I cry about climate or something else, you know, it's the release. You, yeah. you the, 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 a lot of the grief and pain like comes out and it yeah. feels lighter. Yeah, I'm usually crying when I'm writing. Oh. Openly bawling. Wow. Yeah, it looks weird in coffee shops. So. <laughs> they would understood if they read the essay. Not at that point, they wouldn't. <laughs> but there's also, you know, there's all, there, there's so many different ways to go about this. You know, there's um, there's not just one model or one approach. And um, I think for a really long time, the climate movement was a little cookie cutter. Um, it seemed yeah. to demand a certain kind, a certain perspective, a certain background, yeah. and thankfully we're we're getting beyond that. But we need to do a lot more work there too, making sure that people who have a huge variety of different feelings about it um, still yeah. feel at home. Yeah, we um, on my little podcast, we've been doing a lot of like looking back at the climate conversation and like surveying the progress that we've made, and it's amazing how much progress has been made specifically since 2018, um, the year that that massive IPCC report came out. Um, so many zombie narratives got just shattered. Um, there became so much more room for many different ways to feel about climate change because, you know, I feel like hope was really the main thing that you were allowed to feel about climate. And truthfully, a lot of people just didn't feel hope. A lot of people didn't feel motivated by hope. And now we're able to talk about, uh, talk about the story so many different ways. Um, and, you know, as a storyteller, that's exciting. As a human being, it's terrifying that we've gotten to this point. Thank you both so much. Uh, it's, it's, time to, it's time to wrap up, but I, I know I appreciate and I believe I can speak for the other people watching this, that, um, that it's, it's really a privilege to look inside the minds and hearts of uh, luminaries like yourselves. I'd like to reiterate um, that 
everyone is invited to read the first chapter of my book at facingtheclimateemergency.com and that we'll also be having a call, not exactly like this, but in the same way, focusing on the hearts and internal side of the climate emergency rather than the charts and graphs, which are important in their own way on Sunday um, that, that all audience uh, members are invited to uh, come and share. Uh, so, yeah, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.